The stock market is in a bubble and it's going to crash. Well, at least that's what some experts say in the media recently. For example, you've got this article saying that there are two signs the stock market euphoria is mirroring past bubbles and could end badly for investors. So watch out. Another one over here, Business Insider. Uh, bubble extremes lead investors to forget history. Stock market crash, experts says S&P 500 ripe for a steep drop of up to 63%. Oh my God. Uh, stock market chart echoes dot com bubble. Are your investments safe? Ooh, maybe not. <laughs> so what's the truth? Are stocks really expensive? Are they in a bubble ready to crash? Or are stocks actually cheap? Well, let's look at the facts in this video. So how do we know whether stocks are expensive or whether stocks are cheap? Well, there are many ways to value the stock market. Let's begin by taking a macro view and then we take a bottom-up view by analyzing and valuing the individual companies. Now, if you take a macro view, of course, the simplest way to value the stock market is using the P-E ratio. It's not the most comprehensive method, but it's the simplest method that a lot of people look at. So as of now, you can see that the forward P-E ratio of the S&P 500 is currently at 17.1 times earnings right there. So is that considered high or low? Well, depends on historical levels. So if you take a look at the last 10 year average PE ratio, forward PE, it's 17.5 times denoted by this blue dotted line. And the five year average PE ratio forward is 18.7 times the green line. So currently, the uh, forward PE ratio of the S&P is below the five year average and below the 10 year average. So based on the five to 10 year averages, it is slightly undervalued. So in other words, the stock market is not expensive. It's not really damn cheap. It's slightly below its uh, average valuation. But of course, uh, PE ratio by itself is not the most accurate because number one, PE does not take into account the cash flows of the business. Number one. Number two, it doesn't take into account the growth of the business. So some stocks could have a PE of 30, but be cheap because their earnings are growing more than 30%. And some stocks with a PE of five could be expensive because the earnings are not growing. So that's why you have to really look at both the growth of the earnings of the cash flow and not just PE ratio. So we're gonna take a look at that next to get a more comprehensive understanding. Now, some people would argue that the PE ratio of 17 times is uh, not cheap because of high interest rates. That if you look at the last five to 10 years, interest rates were low, so PE could be higher. But now interest rates are high, so PE shouldn't be uh, so high. PE should be even lower. Is that true? Again, let's take a look not just at the last 10 year history, let's take a look at the last uh, 50, 60, 70 year history. Uh, in fact, let's go all the way back to the 1950s, which is um, yeah about over 70 years ago of history. And I've shown this chart before. This chart is actually researched on by Funstrat, which is a very, very useful chart. And you can see that in the last 70 odd years, the 10-year uh, treasury yield, which is the long-term interest rates, have gone you know, anywhere from 1%, zero, all the way to 16% in the 1970s, right? Now, where's the sweet spot? You can see, again, the sweet spot is between 3.5% and 5.5%. So that is the spot where the stock market has the highest valuations of measured by P-E ratio. And it's about 20 times earnings. So historically, when long-term interest rates are be between 3.5 to 5.5%, the S&P 500 was selling at a PE of 20 times earnings. And currently we are near, in fact, slightly below that level, all right? And right now, where are 10-year interest rates? We are now at about 4.8%, which is somewhere about here somewhere about here, right? So we're just near the middle of that sweet spot. So yeah, sure, if interest rates keep going even higher, above 5.5%, 6%, 7%, yeah, sure, stock markets could drop, definitely, right? But if it remains somewhere where we are, 
then stocks are not that expensive. Of course, the fact that the stock market is not expensive does not mean that prices can't go lower in the short term. Remember that in the short term, share prices are driven not just by valuation, they're driven by emotions and sentiment and manipulation. So if there's a lot of fear in the market because of the, the, the Middle East war and this and that, yeah, could prices go even lower in the short term and get even cheaper? Of course it's possible. But over time, they will always rebound to go higher as earnings grow. And the S&P 500 earnings have just gone through an earnings recession in the last four quarters, they have bought them and now earnings are beginning to grow again. So short term market, sure, could go up and down, may still go down a bit, but it will of course bounce higher over time. Now again, this is a macro view. Let's take a look now at a more micro bottom up approach, which is to look at the individual companies in the S&P 500. So remember that within the S&P, you've got 500 companies. And within that 500, of course, you've got some which are bloody expensive, some that are bloody cheap, some that are fairly priced. So if you look at the individual companies, that would give you, give you a better idea what's happening you know, below the hood, right? So what my research team has done is they have kind of com compiled um, the valuations of the 500 companies uh, using Morningstar as a source, Morningstar valuation, they are research valuation, so credit to Morningstar. And here we are, there we go. So out of the 500 companies in the S&P, you can see currently 25% of them are fairly priced. Not expensive, not cheap, just nice, okay? And 24% of stocks are undervalued, which means they are, the, the share price is selling between 10 to 20% below the intrinsic value. And 39% of stocks are very undervalued, selling more than 20% below the intrinsic value. So are there stocks that are expensive as well? Yes, there are. About 6.6% of stocks are overvalued, selling 10 to 20% above valuation. And you do have that 4%, which are bloody expensive, selling above 20% of valuation. So uh, if we break it down in terms of sectors, uh, which are the 11 sectors, all right, communication services, consumer cyclicals, also known as consumer discretionary, uh, consumer defensives, energy, financials, healthcare, industrials, technology, blah, blah, blah. Out of all the sectors, where are the cheapest stocks coming from? Well, take a look at the, the bars, right? So in which sectors do we have the, the longest dark green bars? So the dark green bars are those that are very undervalued, more than 20% undervalued, and the red bars are the ones that are overvalued. So at a glance, you can see that communication services, you have got a lot more stocks that are undervalued within communication services, which include like uh, Meta, which is Facebook, uh, Google, uh, AT&T, Verizon. These are all communication services stocks. So a lot of cheap ones over there. Next are consumer cyclical companies, like your Nike, your Lululemon, your Amazon, your Booking.com, your Mercado Libre. Uh, these are consumer discretionary and again, a lot of cheap stuff over there. Consumer defensives, uh, uh, not super cheap, but you do have undervalued and quite undervalued as well, and more than the ones that are expensive. So these are your Pepsi, your Procter & Gamble, um, and your Hershey's, for example. For example, okay. Now financials, financial services, a lot of cheap, uh, stocks as well, your banks, uh, your mortgage brokers, and your financial exchanges, your rating rating agencies, right? Healthcare, healthcare, very cheap, right? I may do another video just on healthcare. What are the the highest quality healthcare stocks that I look at? So you know, let me know if you're interested to watch a video just on healthcare stocks. Uh, technology. So a lot of people think that yeah, technology is leading the recent bull market, which is true, but still a lot of cheap stocks within the technology space. Real estate, a lot of cheap stocks in real estate, right? So that's where the cheap stocks are. Now, I know some of you are now wondering, so can you tell me what stocks they are that are cheap? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, I tell you what, I'll show it to you only once this time, right? Ready? Okay, here we go. So these are the stocks uh, in the S&P 500 divided into 
those that are very cheap, those are highly undervalued, more than 20% undervalued, those that are undervalued between 10 to 20%, those are fairly priced, not cheap, not expensive, fairly priced within minus 10 to 10% valuation range. Those that are 10 to 20% above intrinsic value, slightly overvalued, and those that are bloody expensive, highly overvalued. Oh, well, there you are, okay? Now, some people will look at this chart and say, okay, let me go buy all the very cheap ones, okay? Is that a good idea? No, okay? So one of the most common mistakes that investors make is to just buy shit that's cheap. No. Remember, cheap crap is still crap. You know something? As an investor, I used to do this as well years ago. And I realized that cheap crap is still crap. If a business is not a great business, no matter how cheap it is, don't touch it. Because it may never recover or may take very long to recover. So I would rather prioritize a very good business that is a bit cheap than an okay, lousy company that's really, really cheap. So remember that as an investor, the number one priority is the quality of the business first, then we look at valuation, not the other way around, yeah? So if you look at stocks that are very, very undervalued, you can see there are quite a number of them, and there are many of them, most of them I won't buy because they are not super high quality, so I won't care how cheap they are. So let me give an example. Look at, in fact, someone sent me an, uh, a message a few days ago. I said, Adam, Delta Airlines looks really cheap. What do you think about Delta Airlines? All right, Delta Airlines. Now, this is a, a company uh, that I will never touch. In fact, I'll never ever invest in any airline business, not even Singapore Airlines, which is one of the best airlines in the world because all airline businesses have lousy business models. They are not high quality companies that deliver consistent uh, revenue, profits and free cash flow over the long run. So sure, you could trade it as a short term trade for stop loss and profit target, but it's not something that you want to buy and hold and close your eyes. So let's take a close look at Delta uh, and explain why even though it's really cheap, you know, I'm not gonna touch it. Remember that when you buy a stock, you're not buying a lottery ticket that you can predict exactly where it's gonna go in a short term. You're buying a business. So the question to ask is, is it a high quality business that has very predictable, consistent, resilient revenue, profits, and cash flow? That's the first thing I look at. So I look at track record. Let's look at the last five to 10 years. And if you scroll down, you can see that for Delta Airlines, yep, revenue, uh, you can see it's growing over here. And then it came down and then it went up. So it's not that consistent, it's pretty cyclical. I tend to avoid companies that are very cyclical. I like more consistency. And then of course we had COVID and then revenue plunged and of course the rebound when countries reopen over there. So revenue is not that consistent. That's one thing I don't like about these kind of businesses, very, very cyclical. Then I look at profits and free cash flow. Now, if you look at the profits of the company, which is in uh, green, the net income or net profits, you can see it's over there. That's the green net profit. And then the next year, it dropped slightly. Then it went up a lot. Then it dropped a lot, then went up, and then dropped, and then dropped, and then went up, and then went up, and then became negative, lost money, and made a bit of money, and made a bit more money. So is that consistency? Does profits grow consistently? No, it's very erratic. It makes money, loses money, makes money, loses money, makes money, makes more money. <gasps> right? That's not a very good business. But more importantly, we look at free cash flow. A great business is one that's able to grow its free cash flow consistently over time. It could go down certain years, but as long as you want to see a clear uptrend. So do we see an uptrend in free cash flow? That's the one in blue. So you can see the free cash flow over there. And the next year it dropped by half. Then it went up and then it went up and it went up a lot and then went down and then went down and went up and went up more and then went negative and then broke even or, you know, basically like near zero. OK, so again, is that consistent? No. <laughs> All right. So this is what I call a low quality business. And it's not the fault of the management. It's not their fault. It's just all airlines are like that. It's the nature of the business. 
And another thing I look at, by the way, there are many things I look at. For those of you who have taken my Wealth Academy Investor Masterclass, or you have taken our Value Momentum Investor course, you know that before I buy a stock, it must pass my seven step criteria. And usually only the top 1% of companies in the world can pass my criteria. So I only invest in the top 1% of companies. 99%, I won't touch them. And that's the first uh, secret of my recipe of investing. Only invest in the best and forget the rest. Uh, no point, right? Just go for the best company. So another criteria I look at, again, there are many of them. I'm just going to talk about some of them right now, is return on capital. Return on capital tells you how uh, efficient the business is at generating profits based on invested capital like debt and equity. So ideally, we want the return on equity to be over 12 to 15%. So for Delta Airlines, that, that looks pretty good, right? They've got an ROE of 48%. Woo, pretty good, yeah? But ROIC is only 5%, so that's not that hot. The difference is that ROIC takes into account the debt that's used to finance the company. So this company uses a lot of debt. So by using a lot of debt and less equity, the ROE looks very good, but the ROIC looks like shit. So that's not something that's amazing, right? We want ideally both to be above 12 to 15%. And sure enough, if you take a look at their debt uh, structure, you can see their current ratio is at 0.44, which is less than one. That means they've got more current liabilities than current assets. And that's pretty dangerous because, you know, they could go bust when you don't have enough assets to cover your liabilities in the short term and their debt to EBITDA ratio is five which to me it's um it's a pretty scary because um you know i'll only want to invest if the debt to EBITDA is three or less and this is like five you know so things like that again even though the stock is cheap no matter how cheap drops another even more i'm not going to touch it you know it's not something that i would dare to buy but again, if you want to trade it, if you've got a short-term trade setup using options or stocks with a stop loss and profit target, that's fine as well. So this is one of those stocks that I call, yeah, maybe for one night stand if you, if you see a reversal pattern, but not a stock that you want to marry. Because when a company doesn't have consistent profits and free cash flow, the stock price cannot go up in the long run. So sure enough, if you take a look at Delta Airlines, and you look at the long-term performance. Now, people always ask me, when I look at the chart of a stock, what time frame do I look at? Do I look at one year, six months, five minutes, which one? And the answer is you have to look at all the time frames. You have to look at a stock from different perspectives. And for me, when I look at a stock, the first time frame I always want to look at is the long-term time frame, which is the 10-year chart. Because if over 10 years you don't see a clear uptrend, forget about it. This company is not a, a consistent, resilient performer. And if you look at Delta Airlines and you look at a 10-year chart, this is the 10-year monthly chart, do you see a clear uptrend? No, you see it going basically nowhere over 10 years. We call this a very, very um, choppy cyclical stock. So on the other hand, are there high quality companies that are also really cheap right now? Yes, there are. There are quite a number of them. And for example, one of them that just reported earnings and earnings were not too bad, pretty good, but the price went down and I think it's cheap. Well, not I think it's cheap. The valuation says it's cheap and it would be, um, where was that? Ah, there we are. It's Alphabet, Google, okay? So Google is really, really cheap. It's more than 20% undervalued. So is Alphabet a high quality business? Well, look at the numbers. It's all about the numbers. It's not about rumors and opinions and feelings. It's all about numbers in investing. So if you look at Alphabet, let's scroll down and let's see over the long run, is revenue growing consistently? Yes, it's growing very consistently. Is net profit growing consistently? The one in green, yep, is growing consistently as well. And you can see it over here, it's uh, enlarged. All right, the one in green, right? Net profit growing consistently as well. 
And how about free cash flow? Is the company generating more and more free cash flow every single year? Yup, in blue, free cash flow increasing consistently as well. So remember that a business is a money-making machine. The more money it makes, the more it is worth, the more the intrinsic value. So when a business, when a stock, every single year makes more and more and more money, the intrinsic value keeps on increasing. And uh, what's the return on capital? Return on capital, you can see is 28%. Return on investment, invested capital, way above the 12 to 15% minimum that I require. Uh, return on equity, 25%. So it's a profitable, it's a profit monster, if you will. And how about the debt? Does it have a lot of debt to worry about? No, the debt to EBITDA ratio is only 0.31, which means that Google could pay off all the debt if it wanted to in less than 0.3 years or four months. You can see current ratio is two. They've got double the current assets versus, versus current liabilities. And again, the amount of cash they have is way more than the entire debt of the company. So if they wanted to, again, they could pay back all their debt. So looks like a pretty high quality company. But uh, is it really very cheap? Now, again, just bear in mind that this uh, data that is from Morningstar, this is based on Morningstar's valuation. So when I do my own intrinsic calculation, my own valuation, I may get a number that is different from Morningstar. Usually it's quite close, but sometimes it could be different. So it's very important to not just take this blindly. You have to do your own intrinsic value calculation. That's why in our courses, we teach our students how to value all kinds of stocks using our intrinsic value calculator, using all kinds of valuation methods. And of course, if you join our UIP, the ultimate investor's playbook, then I do all the valuations for you and it's updated regularly. So you know exactly what are the intrinsic values of every kind of stock. So uh, is Google really, really more than 20% undervalued based on Morningstar? Well, let me double check that. So let's put the numbers into the intrinsic value calculator. Now, they just announced their recent results. So factoring in their latest results, you can see that their free cash flow that they generated over the last 12 months is $77.6 billion. So plug that in. They have got $13.7 billion of debt right now. Plug that in. And they've got $119 billion in cash. My God, Sunda, you've got a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Then the next question is, uh, what's the growth of the company? What's the projected growth rate of the company? Now, if you look at Finviz, for example, go to Finviz, um, you can see that for Google, the projected growth rate for the next five years is 20%. So they expect Google to grow at 20% in the next five years. Um, so I decided in this valuation to be really, really conservative. So I looked at many other websites and I took the lowest one I could find, which is on uh, Capital IQ uh, and the long-term growth for Google based on their research uh, mean is 15%. And again, this is the lowest of all. I wanted to be like really conservative. So take 15% growth for Google uh, for the next uh, five years, right? 15.5%. And I'm going to assume that after that, the next five years, the growth is going to slow down to half. And then finally, the next 10 years is just going to grow at 4%, right? So really conservative uh, growth uh, metrics I'm using. A company recently bought back a bit more shares. So current shares outstanding 12.54 billion. So putting that all in, that gives us an intrinsic value of $188. Ta-da! <laughs> so that's how I know how much the business is worth. It's worth $188 per share. And the current share price of Google, let's plug that in, is $122. So is that a good deal? One, two, two. Yeah, it's selling 35% below intrinsic value. So sure, Morningstar valuation seems to co uh, corroborate, corroborate, yeah, corroborate my valuation, which is, is more than 20% undervalued. Now, uh, again, if you look at any great company, look at the long-term chart, you can see that it's in a very clear uptrend. Uh, you can put in moving averages and you can see how well they respect the moving averages as well. 
right? So they bounce off the moving averages, bounce and bounce, and in a big crash, they bounce off the 50 moving average, bounce the 50 moving average. This is a very strong support that we had. It is a very, very nice uptrend. So at current price levels, it is cheap. It is at an attractive uh, level to accumulate shares. Now, having said that, again, always remember, just because a stock is a great company, is cheap, doesn't mean that it must go up the next day after you bought it. Doesn't mean it can't go lower in the short term. Because remember, again, in the short term, the market is not driven by logic. It's driven by emotions, by sentiment, and by manipulation. So sure, if you buy it right now, you're doing a good job as an investor. You're buying a good company, which is undervalued. But again, could it still go down a bit more in the short term? It is possible. For example, you can see a level of support here at the red dotted line, the 20 EMA. This has acted as a previous resistance and previous support as well. So, you know, you, you buy here, for example, sure, it could still go down here. Now, is it possible that if the war gets even worse and even more shit happens and there's more panic, could it even retest this blue line? Of course, that's also possible, right? But if that happens, should you panic and say, oh shit, I shouldn't have bought here because now it's going down. No, because there's no way you can predict short term what's going to happen because you can't predict the news, you can't predict Israel, you can't predict Hamas, you can't predict all this shit, right? All you can do is to know it's a good company, it's cheap, you accumulate, right? And then you don't go all in at once. You want to buy a bit first and then slowly average in your position. But as an investor, once you know that you've got a good company, why worry? You don't have to buy at the bottom. Even if it goes a bit lower by 5-10%, you know that once the sentiment shifts, hallelujah, it's going to go up back to the intrinsic value of 188 and even higher over time because the intrinsic value will keep increasing as the company generates more and more free cash flow. I hope that you did learn something from these two simple examples, but you know what? There are a lot more great, high-quality companies that are selling at discounts right now, that are really at attractive valuations. So I'm getting really excited. And if the market goes down even more in the short term, I'm going to get even more excited. But you've got to know which are the ones to pick. So remember, only pick the high-quality companies that are undervalued. Avoid the lousy companies, no matter how cheap they are. If you want to learn even more, yeah, do take our value momentum investing course or do enroll for UIP where I will invest and trade uh, every single day and you can watch me do that and learn in the process. So thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.